<clears throat> Hi everyone, um, welcome to today's webinar around developing the physical corner. This is the first one, hopefully a series of events around developing the physical corner. And it's that um, common area we speak about at the grassroots level, but it's sometimes something which is misunderstood and it's not something we understand fully and well enough to help support our players improve their physical skills. Um, deliverers today, so myself, uh, Thomas Sibthorpe, who's the coach development officer here at SCFA, and I'll let Jim Sonsby introduce himself shortly. Um, but to start off with um, a couple of housekeeping rules. So all your microphones are automatically disabled. There will be opportunities um, for conversation throughout the webinar. Um, we will have access to your microphone. There will be a raise the hand symbol that will come up and appear on screen that signals that the floor is open to verbal responses um, and will unmute you when that opportunity arises. There's also a Q&A function that there should, uh, you should find at the top of your screen um, where some questions will be posed during the webinar for you to answer. And myself and Jim will do our best to support um, and respond to some of your questions. Um, so yeah, without further ado, um, I'll pass you over to Jim and he will introduce himself. Um, and hopefully, yeah, we have a really good, um, really great night and um, get a lot of learning. All right, cheers. Cheers, Tom. Thank you for the uh, introduction there. As you said, my name's Jim. Um, I really appreciate you signing up tonight and I'm looking forward to, uh, to talking about this area and going through it. It's uh, on my journey in football. It's been something that I've taken lots of twists and turns in and um, I think I'm finally at a point where I'm really happy with this um, and I mean you can enjoy speaking about it but again I'm sure it's a like anything is an ever evolving process um, but there's say a couple of key things tonight that I would like everyone to to come away with and for me that is a uh, an understanding of uh, what the key movements and all the physical qualities that matter in football are and then just alongside of that the most important thing is how we can actually develop these movements and qualities because I can give you all the understanding or you know thought of what you should do but if you have no idea about how to apply it then I'm not doing you any favors so there are two big things that I want to go through tonight and just on that as well um, I'm going to kind of use the term movement now or actions um, as an umbrella term but there's certain things that would be classified potentially as a physical quality. But again, I don't want to get too murky and grey tonight. I'm going to try and keep it nice and simple. I think from my perspective, that's what I want to get. But I really want to understand what you actually want to get from tonight. Um, so if you could take a minute and just pop some things in the chat box of, of things that you're either looking to explore, or looking to understand. And if there's something that we see now that is not in the presentation, I can make a mental note of it and uh, potentially address it at the end. So yeah, if we take like 60 seconds, Tom, and go through that. Yep, no worries. So for those that have just um, entered the webinar, at the top of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button, which looks like a little question mark with some speech bubbles. Um, or you can use the chat function if it's disabled um, and just put in any um, anything you want to get out from tonight. And uh, like Jim said, we'll do our best to support with your questions. Is there any bits popping through there, Tom, for you? Not at the moment. OK, uh, there we go. Wait, there was something that just popped up there in the chat. Sorry, there we go. Yeah. OK, cool. I haven't got uh, that particular question in, but if we make a note about injury um, prevention, I can chat about that at the end. If you no can worries. remind me, Tom. Yep. All right, perfect. Um, we can move on then, I guess. So just before we go on, just a little bit about me. Um, currently, I'm about seven years deep into my academy football journey. I did an undergrad at Brunel University in sport and exercise science. Bit of a different career path, but eventually came back into sport and did a master's at Middlesex 
um, in strength and conditioning. At the same time, I was lucky enough to get an internship with Mill Football Club, predominantly working with 12s, 13s and 14s age group. Either by luck or me doing something right that year, they kept me on and I got a like a position at the club. So I worked then uh, overseeing the 9s to 16s phases. Um, and then after three and a bit years, made the transition down to South Wales, I got an opportunity to go and be the lead foundation on YDP, uh, like strength and conditioning coach there. Again, fantastic experience in South Wales. For those of you that follow Swansea or know Swansea, very particular style of play and everything from the first team down to the academy was built in that manner. So I learned an awful lot about, uh, again, specific game models and how to build players to fit into a certain system. After six months there, I moved into a PDP role, so worked with the youth team. Um, and then three months ago, so really recently, moved back to London, uh, joined West Ham as a lead YDP FP uh, physical performance coach. So I oversee both those phases, but predominantly deliver to the 15s and 16s, ensuring that boys transition from schoolboy football into full time football. So that's my journey to this point so far. Little disclaimer then as well, this isn't me presenting West Ham's physical development curriculum. It's not me presenting Swansea's physical curriculum. This is my own thought processes. Obviously, there's elements of this that I do deliver because I believe in it really, really strongly. But this isn't me giving you one of their curriculums or pathways. This is me sharing my thoughts on, on why I think movement matters and how I think we can develop it in football. So I probably should start by, by letting you know what why I actually think it matters. So for me, football is just a game of actions. And my fundamental belief is that if we can perform better actions, do more of those actions, maintain the quality of those actions within the game, as well as the frequency of those actions, then we have a greater chance of success within the game. And then the kind of key part of that is, in order to actually do this, we need to give players a really varied toolbox to be able to meet the movement demands of the game. And I think the question that we're going to kind of ask tonight is like, well, what actually needs to go into the toolbox? And say so on my seven year journey to this point, I've I've made mistakes along the way. And probably for the first few years, never respected the fact that movement really does matter. So like a little example of that would be you come out of university and you understand that, you know, if you get players stronger, they're going to get faster. You do absolute speed work on the pitch again they get faster you get stronger players and then when you do your physical testing you've got better looking athletes on paper but i always found that there was a point where it was like well this isn't actually translating to the game and at the end of the day the most important thing is the work that we do translates to what is happening on the pitch so there's a whole journey in it uh, like a process that I've gone on to make sure that the physical work actually translates to kind of on pitch performance. Otherwise, it's it's completely wasted, in my opinion. So then the question that I want to sort of throw out there a little bit is then just to get an understanding from the room is like currently, what do we think matters in football from a movement perspective? So what are the key movements that matter in football? Again, if we just take like a minute, two minutes, use the Q&A function. I'll get it up now and we'll just have a little look what people are thinking. Okay, so a few that have popped up so far, turning and good cardio, <clears throat> explosive power, 
turn sprints, jumping, running, jumping, throwing, change of direction, moving towards the ball and engaging, jumping, pushing, pulling. Again, we'll keep a couple more of these coming. It's good there's like a, a, a similar a similar theme on some of these as well. Try and think about as well as we go through this uh, really specific movements that you see on the pitch week in, week out. So certain things like, as an example, explosive power there or potentially jumping. Uh, like a, or more the explosive power end potentially is an underpinning physical quality that allows you to do movements more effectively on the pitch. OK, if we move on to that next slide then. So movements that generally get pulled up quite a lot and discussed in the research and especially actually when you look at the like things that are put out by the FA um, what England find important and what they track, you'll often hear acceleration, deceleration, maximal speed and then change of direction. So we'll kind of go through each of these in a little bit more detail. High frequency of uh, high intensity accelerations are generally very, very prevalent in football match play. So again, we've got loads of GPS now, players are tracked up to the, to the max. So we know that now from looking at a lot of GPS data, that accelerations in the modern game especially are going through the roof. The ability to effectively accelerate, and we think about this in like 1v1 scenarios, can gain you a massive performance advantage. So aids in the ability to be able to create space and close down space and then really exploit those sort of transitional moments within the game. So we all know that like if we want to press effectively to get to the ball, we have to accelerate quick. And again, if I've got a player pulling back into space to receive back foot, if he gets that touch out of his feet and is able to accelerate quickly, he's going to kill his opponent. So we want to kind of be really, really effective at our acceleration. But then equally at the other end of the, the spectrum, we need to be able to hit the brakes. So again, we're now starting to see that in football match play, high intensity D cells have actually been found to be more frequent than high intensity act cells. And at first it took me a while to think about this one. It doesn't make sense because I thought, again, they should match 50-50 if you kind of accelerate intensely, surely you have to hit the brakes. But I think this is more linked towards just to try and like put context behind it. GPS has lots of different velocity bands and different speed bands. And generally in football, you're always kind of on the move at some point. So you can actually not activate potentially into an acceleration band then if you have to hit the brakes hard, it can register. So that's how some of those data comes up and, and why they're kind of starting to be seen as a little bit more. But D cell is really, really important in our ability to, to rapidly change direction. And then again, when we're thinking about the modern game and how teams like to play, our ability to press is really underpinned by this metric. Because if we can't hit the brakes, we can't slow, it's going to be really, really easy for people to play around us. Sprinting speed is always on like highlight reels. So sprinting has always been or has been linked a lot to game defining moments. So it's like goal scoring actions, assists and then sort of defensive scenarios. Um, over the years, sprint distance is one of the metrics and it's probably one of the reasons, again, on a little side note, like you see a lot more hamstring based injuries. But in the modern game, it's increased absolutely like exponentially and it's predicted to just increase further with players getting stronger and faster and the demands of the tactical game that's placing on them and sort of on that tactical point change of direction so the evolution of the modern game um kind of has seen a greater trend towards like high intensity pressing counter pressing and counter attack so this all requires players to be able to coordinate themselves in a multi-directional manner so generally speaking people will be like Axel, D cell, max speed, and change of direction are kind of movements that matter in football. But what I want us to do now is watch a video, see if we can spot these actions. But also, what else can we see? Because they're not the only movements that happen in football. Because my job would be really, really simple if all you could do was train those four actions. So let's have a little look now. Watch the video. Again, just pop some notes, uh, messages in the the chat box and just let me know what you're seeing and if you can see those actions happening. Hopefully the video works.
and I'm apo apologies as well. I am a Liverpool fan, so I have biased a few Liverpool <laughs> videos in this one. So again, can we note if we're seeing ACK cells, if we're seeing D cells, if we're seeing changes of direction, if we're seeing max speed hits? But again, hopefully we can see it with the video. I know it's a little bit choppy. Can we see other movements that occur within this? I feel like this was a bad clip to use. It wasn't a great game for West Ham. Okay, perfect. <laughs> So again, I'm hoping everyone sort of was able to see that and pick out some of those movements. But the key thing that I kind of wanted to pick out there was that we talk a lot about those actions and those movements in isolation. But when we watch that video, football rarely involves singular movement patterns. Instead, it's a real integration of many different patterns put together. And that's a really, really key part of like how we want to, well, one how we want to train but then two it's like well those four actions weren't the only ones that i saw there so then i think the question then becomes well what else do we need to train and what else do we need to look at so if we can move on to that next slide this this syllabus of actions and movement is is taken from a guy called ian jeffrey so ian jeffrey's work has been hugely influential on on my journey and he's kind of coined the term or created this this concept of game speed so it's a little bit wordy but i'm going to read you the definition of game speed and then we'll break it down to what it understands and talk a little bit more through this sort of like movement syllabus just here so game speed is a, a context specific capacity where an athlete uses movement of an optimal velocity precision, efficiency and control to interact with the environment in order to maximise the performance of a sports specific task. Again, really, really, really wordy. The key things that I take from that are game speed has to be context specific. So for in order it to be context specific, we have to look at the game and work our way backwards from the game. So when you look at football and I look at that video, these are the actions across the pitch that I see. So football can be almost boiled down into, I think I can't remember off the top of my head, but 15 to 20 key actions. And if you can be really, really good and are really, really effective at these, it's just combinations of these. So there's three different types of, of sort of like key movements. So we'll start on the left and you've got your actualization patterns. And we sort of discussed those earlier as like really important movements. But these, in essence, are your go movements. So we talk there's axles, there's maximal speed, but they really just happen from a static start. So you, they can be from a rolling start, they can be linear, and they can be curved. So we can train that movement in different ways. You then got your initiation patterns, which you're kind of starting and changing movements. Now, again, the starting actions can be your linear acceleration steps. So that's just if I'm, you know, on, it with, uh, on the pitch with no momentum and I need to get from A to B in a linear fashion, I just drive forward. But then also like, can I do that from the side? So that would be like what we call like a hip turn action. 
and then also you have to start from the rear so that one would be like uh balls getting played over the top center backs having to turn and cover ground backwards so that type of action generally speaking if you just did actualization and initiation patterns you'd have a pretty good multi-directional speed program but i think and this is where in jeffrey's work has been so useful these transitional patterns these what we call weight in movements this is like the missing gold that always gets missed and it's because these patterns or these things never make the highlight reel actualization and speed and big cuts and changes of direction will always make highlight reels and i always think of this as like nfl when you see those nfl highlight rules of agility it's always like a guy doing this incredible cut into a burst of speed but the good stuff is where Carl Walker does this really well it's like the 1v1 type defending actions and the waiting and the waiting before you go in so this would be what the transitional patterns are so these movements are rarely done at full speed but what it's all about is putting yourself in the best position to be able to act and I always think of it as if you're in a really good transitional pattern you'll be in a really good position to initiate a movement and if you're in a good position to initiate you'll be able to use your speed and your actualization but if you're in a bad transitional pattern or a bad transitional waiting shape you won't be able to initiate effectively and you will never be able to utilize the speed even if you're the quickest player on the pitch it's going to be really hard to actually transfer the speed to how you want it to the game so then the patterns that we look at in transition transitional actions are your basic athletic position so this is where like when you see in 1v1 defending you get into that little low crouch in essence that's our athletic position and then you've got actions like your jockeying you've got controlled running in there again that ability to control and scan your environment before you then want to go is so important a side shuffling or a cross step action it's like again when you're going 1v1 down the line if you want to send your man down the line you kind of you don't really square your hips and turn that way unless you're Virgil van Dijk, but you track them from the side. So it's those type of actions, your ability to backpedal and backtrack, super important. And then we've already talked about decel a little bit, um, and arguably that could be an initiation pattern, but we kind of classify it under transitional. So again, this would be a syllabus of actions that you would want to try and explore to create effective movers for football. And then if we move into that next slide. I kind of wanted to again just now take a minute. And for us to sit and think about well, how often do your players actually get exposed to those actions? Do they get exposed to those actions? How frequently? Um, yeah, and just have just have a little think. And even have a think about where in what scenario they might get exposed to them on a week to week basis. Just on that, Jim, as well, I think um, for the learners in the room as well, think about when we work at things in your setting, generally we can look at movements in isolation. So if we want to make people quicker, we, we work on them sprinting. I think what Jim's trying to highlight here is, you know, to what degree do we practice where players are moving in a variety of ways and across different types of actions all at the same time? And do we expose them to that? Or do we simply expose them just to straight line running, just to jump in? just to twisting and turning as an example. So hopefully that can just sort of um, relate a bit more to your context and just think about when do we expose them to that variety? Yeah, that's perfect. That's a good point, Tom. OK, let's uh, we'll move it on to that next next slide then. So before we sort of um, talk about how we then apply this in the setting and how we train these actions there's this concept that i love um and it's called the ooda loop so i don't know if some of you may come across it or heard of it before but it's from a guy called john boyd so this was, this concept was born within the u.s military and in essence the ooda loop was created as part of the the training for the fighter pilots i think in i can't remember which war it was but i think it may be the korean war something like that but they basically found or John Boy found that the planes that they had were more maneuverable. They had better shifting speeds in the air. They could change altitudes quicker and they could change directions quicker. And what they were actually surprised at was that they were able to outperform the enemy that had 
way faster like max speeds and like capabilities so for the the us like maneuverability of their planes became really important so that's great we got our like in essence i create that to the syllabus that i've just showed you the the game speed curriculum we can get the, all these movement patterns and we can be really really good at them and we can be more maneuverable but the key element then is they needed to upskill the pilots and train the pilots to utilize all the skills that the tools had to offer and i think this links a little bit back to what tom's saying about if we just do things in isolation do we really teach them how to use the tools in the environment and in their scenario in combat so there's this process of the OODA loop that they took people through um and it's I, I think it's a really simple tool but really powerful so the first point is observe and again it's kind of i suppose the definition will be really obvious but we're searching and processing for information in our specific environment but we also were observing based on past experiences so i think of this as like when i'm looking at training movement in football and varying practice design we need to give our players as many different experiences as possible so they've got more experiences to pull from um, to sort of solve the problems that the game throws at them if we're only doing the same types of practices and the same type of games to help them try and improve them we're never going to give them the observational skills that they need to actually improve and be a lot more adaptable to different types of games orientate is like how i interact with the environment and this is how I sort of source my information, but I can also like influence the conditions of my environment. So the way I think of this is like in a 1v1, if I change my body shape or my angle, my body shape, I can influence what my opponent does. So if I stand square on at my opponent, he can go left and he can go right. So he has space either side. If I take a step to the right and orientate my body slightly on a diag, he only has the option of the left. So I've narrowed my decision making process which is the next part and i forced him in one direction but again just exploring those different 1v1s and different environments allows players to figure that out and we can sort of like guide them along on that process then obviously we have to decide um, and this is where we're selecting the appropriate course of action so the better that our observation skills are and the better that we learn how to orientate our body we can better decide which tool we need and that might be I'm going to go I'm going to go side on I'm going to show my player down the line linking back to my syllabus I might need a lateral shuffle to keep up with him then I need a hip turn initiation pattern to get out and then I need to accelerate to cover that run so that's like an example of like we're giving them some tools we understand again how what how we use the tool in that environment and then now we need to obviously act on that decision and then that's just basically like the execution of all these phases but the really important thing there is that as soon as you act the loop changes again and the picture changes so you're always like going back into the loop and i suppose the key aim of this and why i like it and the, the thought process about it is i'm trying to close my loop quicker than my opponent if i can close it quicker i take control of situations and i deal with the situations well if my opponent is closing loops quicker than me i'm probably going to get beaten so i need the ability to close my loop quickly and for that I think again it's lots of different what we're going to talk about now like practice types and variability to then give you experiences to be able to do that so how we can develop movement two ways of doing it games and purposeful play so this is predominantly without the ball and then you've got the practice design which is your with the ball so that would be how you structure a training session because again if you're a little bit short on time like the you can get so many great outcomes through football in practice but it just takes clever manipulation of drills to get the actual outcomes that you want so the first bit without the ball really big fan of like purposeful play um and i'm going to leave that quote on the screen if you want to read through it um i'm not going to read that one word for word but i think for me like uh from from what I've seen over time, like potentially modern society just limits opportunities for, for kids to play a little bit. And while like purposeful play is not free play and there's so many benefits to free play, what we're doing is putting putting kids in environments where they have an opportunity to explore and an opportunity to learn. 
um, we can be really cute and creative with how we manipulate our games to get a little uh, to get a really positive transfer to football. And then we can expose players to the sort of the situations they might not usually find themselves in. And again, when it's done in a play based setting, potentially they might take more risks because it's a safer environment to fail. Sometimes when there's a, a football game on the line, they might not take the risks because they don't want to uh, sort of cost their teammates anything. So plays a really valuable tool in this scenario. And say, what? Well, there's four types of games without the ball that I really like. So you've got race and chase games, 1v1 games, tag games, and then invasion games. So the physical outcomes that we get from playing these types of games are you get your acceleration, you get your max speed, you get your deceleration, you get change of direction, you get cardiovascular development, but you get a lot of game speed exploration, especially with 1v1s, tags and invasion. The psych outcomes, which are again really important still, uh, you get problem solving, spatial awareness, player awareness, perception, action, coupling, tactical skills and emotional resilience. And then you shout out so, uh, social? social outcomes, teamwork, fair play, sportsmanship, leadership, and then dealing with winning and losing, and then some communication skills. So just from like 10 minute games, which I'm going to sort of suggest and showcase now, like you can get so many great outcomes and, and be really making a dent into improving players uh, movement across the pitch. So we've got race and chase games to start with. These are really, really good for developing your acceleration and max speed. They drive competition and like uh, intent. No one wants to lose these. So you end up getting like high quality reps. You can vary the start positions. So that means you could get more of those initiation shapes because you can do it front, side, back. Um, through experience, I've tended to find in, in my journey that, especially at younger age groups, sometimes like practices get quite small. So we never really give players the ability to stretch their legs and actually get good at running fast over distances, so max speed. So if you are doing races over a big space, you're actually just giving players a, a great chance to explore how to 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 run to run fast and and basically like figure out the best solution to do that. And I always think in those situations, the coach should sort of guide rather than instruct during the walk backs recovery. And what we were talking about as well is uh, I'll try and get some some videos or maybe we'd, we'd do a practical base session on this about the games, but like a simple game like Rats and Rabbits, where you've got two players facing each other, a 10 metre run off either side, you call rats to go that way, rabbits to go that way, they have to drop step or hip turn to go left or right, and then they race each other, like a, a variation of noughts and crosses where they accelerate in, pop a bib down, and then pursuit is, uh, again, just someone, I start here, my opponent starts here, we race, and I hunt him down, and again, you can vary the start positions to get so many good outcomes. And then your 1v1 games, I really love these, like they allow players to explore how to attack and defend one we one scenarios. But by not including the ball, it can highlight if players struggle uh, like with a technical football issue or a technical movement issue. Um, I think it really helps develop players awareness around body orientation. So a really part key part of that OODA loop, controlling flow and then controlling momentum. Um, they are more I call them like quite exploitative because generally speaking in a 1v1 there's quite a specific movement solution that often leads to success so you don't maybe get general exploration as much um, removing the ball though acts as like I call it like an overload because if you take the ball away players often run quicker so if you're having to defend at a quicker rate your decision making has to become way quicker so hopefully when the ball's added into the mix you can actually deal with those situations a lot better and uh, just from experience of using these for for well, probably like four years now, over time I've seen such good improvement in a player's ability to translate this into 1v1s when they're coupled together. Um, and then the games I try and use a little bit sparingly though, again, just because sometimes they can be overly contextualised, you can make them a little bit more uh, relevant to, to younger players. But simple mirror games are quite general. We call it like a shake and bake, which is a mirror into a race or bursting through a gate. And then I'm going to show you some 1v1 pitch based scenarios later. But 
in essence, noble variations of those games work really, really nicely as well. And then tag games, big fan of tag games. Uh, anecdote on these, I was chatting to an old colleague who went to do a study visit at PSV Eindhoven and he was talking about how they recruit their players. And again, this may not be true, but I think it is because they told him it when he was there, but I'd like to think it was because it backs up the fact that I love tag games. Um, they spend the first 40 minutes of a recruitment session playing stuck in the mud and anyone that they deem an inefficient mover doesn't go through to the next process because they look for effective movers um, and then it's like now you can progress to the next stage so I thought that was a really interesting a way of trying to do things and it's, it's such an easy thing to do but obviously they allow players how to explore and evade opponent like sorry exploring how to evade opponents slash multiple opponents I like the fact that you have to get a lot of 360 awareness. So at Canadian, your development for scanning around the pitch, you get a really high variability to like general agility skills. So you'll get loads of like those game speed type actions in a really chaotic environment. Um, and say so they're a bit more exploratory based than a 1v1 only. Um, I think again, I link this to the PSV thing. Like I think they can really highlight ineffective movers. Um, and then the tagger just gets loads of exposure to repeat pressing so if that's something that you want to encourage your players to do they have to do it within tag games so speed tag is an example where it's like a like 15 by 15 grid for example there might be five people in the grid five people on the outside one tagger runs in tag someone runs out next person in next person in next person in and it's like a team game to see who can get their players out the quickest um bulldog over really big spaces again you can still get your max speed running in with these tag type games bib tag stuck in the mud like this this could be an opportunity for the kids to explore and just do tag games that they really enjoy and then invasion games um again big classics like it probably leads, leads itself into a little bit of multi-sport but more purposeful multi-sport but again you kind of encourage team collaboration um Games are very general, so you get lots and lots of variability in the actions that are going to perform. There's a massive, massive degree of purposeful play here, and you can adapt them to big or small based games. But again, I won't go through them in too much detail because I'm conscious of time as well. But we call it like end ball, power ball and capture the flag are, are absolutely fantastic games to, to go through on this one. So We'll move on to how we can kind of get it from football based practice. So I think everyone would be aware of the step based principle, um, which I know we spoke when I spoke to Tom is something that is presented and used. And again, it's it's perfect for how we can manipulate. So obviously your sizes will really manipulate the physical outcomes that you get and the type of movements and the type of actions that players will experience within the training session. Um, so if we go on to the next slide. <clears throat> One v ones, like I, I love these so much. Um, I think they just get so many physical outcomes, um, and there's so many of the game speed actions that get incorporated. They're always done at high intensity, but I like again. It's one of those things that you spot is one v ones are more than just one scenario. There's loads and loads of different ways one v ones occur on the pitch. So this is a, a bit of a playbook from six that. I've used really, really frequently with the ball. The the one in the top left, number one is the, the general one you see. Defender passes to attacker, attacker runs at him down the line and he tries to score in a mini goal or, or drive down that way. But we would call that defender in front attacker with momentum. But we want to be varied in our practice. And again, it's the OODA loop, as many experiences as possible, as many scenarios as possible. So number two, attacker without momentum defender in front and then the space side beside them so very different uh solutions to the problem that is in front of you number three defender alongside attacker going down the line again the defender is going to have to have a choice here does he run with hips square does he get side on how does he counteract a really quick player in these situations and then if you're a quick player how do you utilize your speed can you avoid getting trapped down the line can you cut down the inside uh number four um defender coming across horizontally um attacker going down the line again very different movement solutions that the the defender has to do 
um, very different situations and, and technical skills as well, I should add, that the attacker has to do to get success. Number five, now the defender's got a little bit of momentum, but how can the um, attacker use the defender's flow against them and go back in the opposite direction? Um, I think there's some Tiago clips, obviously there is, because he's unbelievable, but Tiago clips are doing this really well. And then big, but 1v1s don't always have to be small. So big space 1v1s and big space 2v2s and 3v3s, really, really valuable. So number six is an example of a big space one, defender recovering, attacker driving forwards. So again, if you're looking to press high up the pitch, you're going to leave all this space in behind. Your defenders get exposed to it. So you have to expose them to it in training practice so they can deal with it. So it's almost like a big race to a ball. Can you slow your feet down? Can you show outside? Can you stop the attacker cutting down the inside? And again, there's going to be different success for the attacker and defender. So there's some six scenarios that if you were to replicate these, and, and potentially use and vary the practice, I think you'd see some really good value in it. And then possession type drills, again, haven't gone into like super amounts of detail with this, but how you manipulate your possession can get you very different outcomes. So obviously possession can be big, small, directional, non-directional. <clears throat> so a small space directional three team game will get you through the roof of Axel's D cells and change the direction. That three team nature makes it so 360 that players always have to be moving and proactive. Um, we've done that before off a one touch, which is really good. But again, if depending on the technical level of the player, you might want to let them have as many touches as you can, but players really have to cover, how cover around and get around the pitch. But then equally big space, if you want to get your players quicker over and um, work on runs in behind. Playing into end zones is so, so effective and it stretches defenders. It gets them turning, it gets them covering back into space behind them. But then you've got non-directional small space, which could be some rondos. So again, a little bit different, like a real classic box pattern 5v2. You can have one in the middle, but those people in the middle were having to do so many little repeated actions to get around. And then you can go non-directional over big space and you can make it like a gate game. And this like a big, big, just when I always think with big space, you can I'd err on the side of go bigger rather because you can always make it smaller, but you're guaranteed to get the outcomes you want if you make it really nice and big. Um, but gate game would be loads of different gates scattered around a big space. And then you're just looking at teams to pass, pass, pass and drive through a gate. Um, again, it gets defenders, especially. I always say the centre backs in the game sometimes just doing nothing at the back. Like this gets them really working. Um, so gate games are a fantastic option to use there as well. And then classically, what you'd say at the end is you're you just your normal type games. I haven't included medium sized games because I've, I've got a polarised approach, but you've got your small sided games, you've got large sided games. Small sided games, games are generally going to get you loads of back cells, loads of D cells and loads of change of direction. Um, obviously, they're going to the, the frequency at which you have to go into those game speed type actions as well becomes way more. I'd say that if you're going to go small sided games, ideally for 4v4 or under, and then that would be the max playing size that you'd want to go to get the outcomes that you want. But then when you flip it, <clears throat> if you want to go big space, you get loads of sprint distance, loads of high speed running, loads of meters per minute. So this is going to be like your cardiovascular development. Uh, you play for slightly longer periods, potentially. Um, you 60 by 40 is about the minimum that you'd want to play through. Um, so that is just under box to box and nearly full width. But again, there's no reason that you couldn't stretch that slightly and really challenge your players to 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 run in behind and, and have opportunities to to express themselves in slightly different ways. So I'd, I'd always think about polarizing just a little bit. Um, and, but that would be generally the outcomes that you'd expect to get from from those types of sessions. And um, yeah, and that that's pretty much me i try to wrap up a little bit quicker and i think there's a few questions because i want i did want to leave like a good 15 to 20 where possible to to answer any questions or anything that you 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 want to go through on that but um yeah over to, to tom yeah thanks jim so um just to kind of just 
to wrap up some of the stuff Jim said before we open the floor a little bit more and I've made note of all the questions by the way that have been put in um, some of them I've summarised as well because some of them are um, similar in nature but I guess first of all, what I want to say is um, some of this stuff you might already know but hopefully you now begin to see this through a little bit of a different lens um, so for example you might now see a greater value in increasing the space and increasing the distances you put your players um, or you, you allow your players to experience to get different actions different movement returns um, and hopefully what's come across as well is Jim's love and passion for movement and um, physical development and I think that's quite evident for me on this web and hopefully you get that across as well so we want to thank Jim for his time especially today um, and hopefully we look forward to delivering a, a practical workshop on this sort of theoretical side and hopefully this is wet your appetite so what I'd like to do now first of all Jim if that's okay with you is just um, give you a couple of questions based on yeah, yeah. some of the things I saw earlier and something I'm seeing at the minute and then we'll open the floor up to any additional questions that haven't been answered um, so I guess in terms of you know children and young people that go through their growth spurts or they get yeah. older is there anything that they need to be aware of um, anything coach needs to be aware of um, during that period or is it a case of just continue with what you're doing no it's a, I, and to be honest that's probably a whole three-part webinar in itself um the the thing that is gonna flare certain symptoms is gonna be the repeated the repeat the trying to word it the best I can. So lack of variability in the program and repeated stress of the same actions will probably exacerbate any growth related symptoms. So like loads of jumping, loads of sprinting, loads of change direction, loads of kicking, like really does does hurt the boys. Um, so where possible, like, and this is why I think I'm such an advocate of different type spaces is variability in the program can definitely help to, to manage that. I think if anyone's reporting any symptoms, the best thing again is uh, just a, a slight modification. So usually aggressive deceleration actions, if you've got Osgoods, is not going to be good for you. Obviously, severs is pretty debilitating, which is around the heel and the ankle. So like sprinting, jumping, changing direction becomes incredibly painful as well. And then as boys get a little bit older, it, it is more around the hip. Um, so you've got to be really aware of the ball striking when it comes to that point. So I think it's that same of uh, the more you can vary your practice, you, it's, yeah, it's a general sweeping statement because it's not always going to help. But variability definitely does help because it stops players being exposed to exactly the same stresses consistently. What you would not want to do is like, as an example, is two small sessions in a week, one big, one small. And that that should just to help even things out a little bit. Um, but like I say, the, there's definitely um, a whole webinar series that you could do on sort of growth and, and maturation. And uh, yeah, it's it's quite a, a complex, multifactorial topic. So I'm, I'm going to be careful not to say anything too generalised here. Um, yeah, I'm sorry if it's too vague. No, no, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Um, I think as well, just on that, I think some maybe a misconception around growth is that people, players become uncoordinated all the time. And I think that's not always the case. But I think what Jim, the key message is variability is probably key. Um, no matter what you, you know, that the worst thing you can do is provide variability to your players. Um, a question around sort of mixed groups or um, mixed sexes, for example, boys and girls. Um, is there any differences between them? Um, how can I manage mixability or, or mixed groupings? Yeah, obviously I, I, I work on sort of the, the boys slash men's side, so I've not necessarily had the, uh, I don't encounter sort of mixed, too many mixed um, sessions. Hard for me to comment because uh, obviously I don't, but I couldn't see at the younger ages too many issues with movement games, 1v1s and, and practice types not, not being like... Uh, like even or square like it shouldn't be a problem when you look at uh, a lot of research around like long-term athletic development often girls will mature slightly quicker anyway so you'd probably find that actually in some of those movement games that girls themselves may perform <laughs> slightly better than some male counterparts just because again they're maybe developing at a slightly quicker rate um, obviously, once they've gone through growth spurts and, and things like that, it, it would completely change change that aspect. Um, and in terms of mixed ability, again, I think that just comes down to um, pairings within groups. 
Um, can you pair people up that complement each other or stretch each other? So something I like to do is uh, if I know someone's IDP is dealing with runs in behind, in certain situations, I'll pair him up with the fastest player to put him into those situations. So actually just being really cute with how you pair people up. And if you're like, well, actually, this this these two have uh, things that can complement each other and help each other. I think it's a really good way rather than just you pick and you go with your mate and you keep it nice and consistent. You just think about like how you can use the players you've got and the skill sets they've got to help each other. And even if it's a, a quiet person with a, a good communicator, uh, I think those things could could work really well, potentially. No, perfect, brilliant. Um, there was quite a couple of questions around spec. I can never say the word specificity of what you teach. I've done well there to say that on my second attempt. Um, so for example, is there like do we need to teach running techniques? Is do we need to target certain muscle groups? Is there a certain way of doing something? I know you spoke about variability quite often. Is that the same for that sort of um, answer? Yeah, it's um, yes and no. Like it's uh, there are r running technique. Is, a, is an interesting one because I've had the, a lot of those conversations and I've sat in a lot of meetings where we discuss movement and we discuss, yeah, oh, is, maybe their running looks a little bit funny. Um, I will bring it back to variability. The reason that I've previously encountered strange running gates at maybe that sort of like 12, 13, 14s age is like I mentioned before about practice types being quite small. If your player's only ever known a 20 by 20 box, he only knows how to do actions in a 20 by 20 space. He's never had the opportunity to open his legs and figure out how to actually run. So the young, as they're younger, they're, again, the more experiences you can give them, they're very, very like, uh, like receptive uh, and they learn in, in such an interesting way when they're younger. Like they figure out the best solution and then you don't have to, in essence, like, quote unquote, fix it when they're older. And actually, like, there's been periods where I've, I, again, it's, I've come in, I've delivered IDP sessions where it's like, we're going to work on this guy's running mechanics. But actually, like, when I look at it, there's little 10 minute, 15 minute, maybe in half an hour sessions, like once a week. Yeah, they give him some basic concepts, but when he's playing football, he's going to resort back to type. So again, making sure that even in the coaching practice, the player gets exposed to those actions and has a chance to to do them, um, is so, like super super important. So unless you know, running technique is very specific, and good sprinting technique is really specific. Unless you are really really good with your like sprint mechanics, then I wouldn't do it, and I would just allow players. I'd set the environment up to allow players to sprint if you're really good and you know what to look for maybe then you can go in and coach and maybe do some mechanical work um but it's one of those things like that be 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 careful doing that and i think the first portal call would be alter the space over time and just see if you get a better outcome and then again just make subtle changes from there on yeah no thanks i think that's a really key point as well that sometimes we can go and intervene and sometimes if we lack the understanding at this current moment in time, we might be actually doing more harm than benefit to that player at that moment in time. So like you said, put the player's needs at the start. At the, you know, that's the main thing you need to prioritise as coaches. Um, and like you said, if you're not exposing them to them sprints, then we shouldn't really be telling them they can't sprint, for example. Um, so think about the playing space, like Jim said. And I guess on that note as well, and this probably answers the question around many of the coaches in the um in the webinar gym will be changing formats whether this season or in the future so whether that's smaller format to larger format um i know you spoke earlier about obviously the changing in size of pitch spaces so for example from a 5v5 to 7v7 to 9v9 to then v11 um, i'm assuming then that if coaches preparing to change format then they probably need to get ready to expose them to the distances they're likely to then see and experience in that format coming up would you would you agree with that or is there anything else you would add no, yeah, a hundred percent. I think um, just because they maybe play five v five again, it's it's in it's it's again that that key word like variability and exposure and different types of experiences. I think um, like you say that just because you play five v five at the weekend, you have to think about what the future is going to bring and think of it as a longitudinal thing. So you can still expose them to three v threes over 
you know, 50 meters if you wanted. Um, it's like that. That's an extreme example. Maybe not that big, but you get the 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 idea. Like it, you can stretch the pitch out and make sure that players get opportunities to sprint in behind and and long. Um, that that variability keys is 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 p and is key. Sorry, and it's it's something that we and I have done in previous clubs and still to this day will do. We we sit down with coaches and suggest these things because. Again, it's really easy to focus in on the age groups that you're with, but when you zoom out and see that long-term picture, it's uh, it's how you prepping them for the for the future. Cheers. Um, Scott wrote a message, and it probably links into something early in the webinar um, regarding sort of the players reacting and engaging early. Um, mm. I'm assuming that might link into sort of tag games and things you spoke about before. Is there anything else you wanted to add to that? So, any any recommendations to help the players get better at reacting to the ball or the situation? Yeah, like uh, the invasion games and the tag games, obviously really useful for that. 1v1 games as well could be really good if you're looking to sort of, again, engage, get tight. Um, and then just loads of variety of 1v1s. I think they they okay. would they would work really well. But um, again, it's, yeah, the tag, the tag works beautifully for it. Um, you can set conditions for games on on multi-sport or invasion type games and like I say even the 1v1s you can make like a 1v1 tag based game where you get you get incentivized for getting to your man quick and getting a double hand tag um but I think that that comes again well, underrates isn't it that comes with a little bit of age as well and just education um I think at that age sometimes they're not always switched on to the next action so it could even be that you do rather than 1v1s you start introducing them to 2v1s because again, 2v1s, there's always a second option. So it's not just engaged to go, it's maybe there's a, a run the other way, or I'm a big fan of for, for stuff like that, of like wave type practices. So it's like a 2v1 into a 3v2 because an action has to happen back the other way. So they could be really good ways to to link it with a football as well. Just think on that as well. I think we have to reflect on the age group that we're working with. So with under eights, and I always use this analogy, would you let an under eight cross the road by themselves? probably not so if we expect them to react to everything and understand reactions we might be doing a little bit of a disservice to them and what they can actually do at that time so sometimes just remember that um, all the things Jim says are really effective ways to support players to get better but the age and the development stage of the people we work with is likely going to inform what they actually can do at that moment in time so just always think back to that what are my players what are their needs where are they developmentally um, so yeah always think back to the age make it age appropriate